Timeliness will be good. So, so uh, this is my good colleague and Fred Th uh, uh, Thomas Talbot. He, I will always call him Brett because uh, he goes by Brett too. So don't be confused. He doesn't have an evil twin, although I think he wishes he had one. Um, I knew I met uh, Brett when he was uh, um, uh, an officer and was um, the command for Tatric um, at the U.S. military. And he's since moved on to lots of exciting projects, including USC, UCLA. Um, a number of different game development uh, studios, uh, mostly on the East Coast, because he lives on the East Coast. Um, so he's a great approachable person. Just throw up a, a, a hand if you have a question. So I'm turning it over to uh, Thomas. All right, well, it's great to see you all today. It's the end of the day, it's the stretch. So wake up, we're gonna have a good time, hopefully, today. Um, and hopefully this talk will be a little bit different. Um, I've been just be debating about what to talk about today. I want to talk about conversation games, dialogue agents a little bit. And this will be kind of like the Reader's Digest tour. So as you understand, here's a picture of myself where I wrote my first game uh, on a TRS-80 in seventh grade. And there I'm playing a handheld console car racing game that did exist back then in the 80s. Um, also, was a, I'm a, was a, spent a lot of time as an army doctor. I'm actually a pediatrician uh, and uh, had a lot of fun doing those things. And uh, I wrote lots of simulators, programs, multimedia games, either myself or with others, uh, mostly for educational purposes. And, uh, and I like things that don't suck, and I like things that work and are enjoyable to use along the way. And I don't care if it's a game or a simulation, it doesn't really matter, as long as it works for me. And people use it and like it. So uh, the tour today is we're gonna look a little bit at interactive dialogue and games, uh, conversational simulations, dialogue agents, conversation design patterns, and why I think this is important. All right, anybody have a problem with that? <laughs> All right. So, I'd like to start with a classic. West of house, you're standing in an open field west of a white house with a boarded front door. There's a small mailbox there. You know, there's something cool. When computers were on teletypes, or just had a little text terminal, you're a little more constrained, and what you said and how you said it mattered a lot more because it painted the whole picture for you. Yeah, there were space wars with the graphics, but most things were text. And so that means we had to rely on story and narrative. And to try to interact with characters, and we're talking about interacting with characters, NPCs today, um, was fairly limited back then. Um, but with games like this, you can go around north, south, east, west, inspect, take something. If there's a character, you could talk to them. But the problem with that sort of thing is you've got to deal with real people and what they're going to do. So you're always going to have this guy, right? And there wasn't a lot of code. I mean, Zork ran in like a 16K machine. So you weren't going to be able to handle lots of different types. You had to know the right words to type in, generally, it was a problem. Some people could never complete these games because they never figure out what was that one word I can use here. And that's the problem when attempting dialogue uh, to talk is what you have to use the exact right word, at least back then you had to. And that was a big limitation of uh, these sorts of things. But I still love that text world because it's, I think it's magical. And then, you know, you could interact with characters and they, you put dialogue and quotes to try to make these characters more expressive. Um, there's a game called Tavern and you might be able to take the food or wine or respond a certain way. Fairly limited interaction. If we go forward, I'm glad we had creator of uh, Ultima Underworld. I'm, I'm a really big fan of uh, Richard Carey and all those things. And I remember playing, actually the first time I really tried talking to a character in a game was in Ultima 3. And I was in Lord Britannia's castle and there was like one character was a kid moving around. And I was, oh, I'll talk to the kid. And he's like, oh, that's a neat sword you have. Well, and every time I took talk, he would say a little something different. And it took a while before I realized I was completely wasting my time. What am I doing talking with a little kid and the cat, they, what would they know in the adventure? But what they would do here is you could see the mechanic. Talk north. You see a huge horned leather winged demon. I am called Sir Vral. Or you could, if you're in the conversation with uh, Lord British here, you can say name. Oh, my name is Lord British. I'm so and so. It's fairly thin experience. Anybody played this? Yeah, right on. Great. Love the love. Great, so in Ultima one through three, if there were anything like this, it was just a simple answer or a very linear thing. Ultima four and four, there was a little bit of dependency either where you could branch in the conversation a little bit 
or it'd be dependent on something you've done or not in your quests. So as we moved on with these games, they got more graphical. Uh, anybody recognize this game? King's Quest, right? And what was nice about King's Quest, it had a graphical element, but it had a text element. But it was still pretty much the same paradigm, and I still didn't always know the exact right word or what to do there. That didn't interpret. So let's move forward to this little game that I, I hear a few people have played, A World of Warcraft. Now, it still has the text thing there. You can message other people in the MMO and do things, but we've gone farther and farther. We've, the more we've shown, the less we tell through words in general, and I liked World of Warcraft. I played it, except I have a life, and it was a time sink, and I stopped playing it. But I think my problem with the interaction with the NPCs is either they're something you kill, or they're these like explanation point dudes. Now, I give credit to the writers that they have nice little text in the box, so I gotta go get my quest. And I always kind of wondered, wouldn't it be good if you meet that character in a bar and the conversation unfolds that you might get a quest that would be cool that no one else got? Or something like that. It doesn't work that way. You got this big explanation point. And how can we have these cool graphics, these amazing network technologies? You can even 3D print your character, all these things, and we still have this dumb explanation point. I think that's a limitation, and I don't know why that's ex always acceptable. Maybe it's fine, but I, I'm not sure I like it. I think it's very limited. You know, may, maybe Sputter Valve should, you know, you can't, he does have a little bit of a personality based on what's written here as text, but I don't think that's much more than the game Tavern that I showed earlier with the blue screen. Um, we've seen a trend that we mentioned in the earlier panel, a narrative, that you had games like Grand Theft Auto that were purely action games. And then they would develop, as things went on, they would develop storylines and they would kind of blend a narrative of kind of recorded content as you play the game to experience this, but you're still not, you're still basically going up and beating up people and stealing cars and doing that sort of thing. It doesn't really alter, it was pretty, not that deep to the gameplay, although I know that uh, Rockstar was trying to get into that a little bit. And you've seen some of those elements in some other games, like here's a favorite of mine, StarCraft. And you see there's a little tiny window there in the bottom, and when you play the games, you'd actually kind of get a nice storyline. All they had was voice actors, and they have this little window that needs a character would chomp of their mouth. But the thing is, people really got to know and like Jim Rayner and Kerrigan and all these characters just from using a little bit of narrative that's thrown in. And as that game has evolved from a 1990s game to a 2000s game to a 2010s game, the narrative elements, the parts about the characters have become more to the forefront where they put in the expensive cinematics and all the things like that. And they even have like the NPCs chatter during the games in the, at least in the solo player missions with little along the way, that sort of thing. But it still lacks the interactivity. You don't get to question Jim Raider or the medic, the scientist guy that's in, you know, the new StarCraft II or any of those things. You don't really, it's still that barrier of communication. And a lot of what I do isn't for entertainment titles, or social simulations. So we'll do like a, a, a job interview to help a young autistic adult rehearse job interviews so they have a higher chance of getting a job. They really do. I do, as a medical doctor, I train young doctors and students how to talk to patients or how to convince them to do things you want them to do um, or explain things better to them or handle their grief or fear. Um, or people do other various things and other kind. I'm not the only one who does these simulations. And that requires a certain degree of uncertain technology. Depending how time flows, I may show some more extra bonus videos today, but we'll see. So where I think these conversational simulations, actually, if there's a grandfather to them, I actually think it's in these Japanese dating sims is where I think really these things actually in some way came from. Because here's some of the first entertainment tells that depend on interaction. Not all of them do. The two pictures at the top are something called Toki Meki Memorial, which is considered a classic, where you've got to do all kinds of things before navigating branch conversations with the characters to get them to fall in love with you, but you also have to get good grades on your homework, and maybe a good athlete at school, and all these other variables, and it's really complex. And they're very strange games. Um, there's a whole bunch of things where a guy can get a harem of women. There's erotic versions called Aerogay where you've got to seduce them. There's versions for females, uh, romance games where you can meet uh, effeminate men and try to get them to be your boyfriend, like the picture here. 
um, dream voice. And then these aren't just in Asia, they're mostly in Asia, but I looked on Steam and they've got stuff there. So if you want to try it out, go ahead. It'll be on your record, but go ahead, try them. And um, it, they're fairly thin, but at least there's an attempt at some interaction there. Um, when we look at some of the dialogue approaches we can take, there's different technologies. Each one of these is like an hour lecture or more, but we could still, we could just parse things that they take, like name, I'm Lord British, or in simple responses, like the kid. Or we can do something called interactive choice-based dialogues, or we can take that artificial intelligence with natural language understanding and try to process what's going on. And that could either be a, a flat database underneath or it can be some goal-directed sort of AI doing something cool. And that's kind of, I don't invent that technology, but I work with a lot of people who do, and I make applications out of it. And that's what I do in my job. So one type example of a parser is, is something called ELISA, which was written in the late 60s. There was a more advanced version called um, not Parrot, but something like Perry. Um, but this is supposed to be a kind of a simulation of being going through a psychotherapy, but it pretty much is a program that understands certain keywords and throws phrases back at you without, under without knowing anything. Um, and it, on the surface level, it has some entertainment value and seems like it's doing something. And there, in the more advanced version of uh, Perry, uh, there actually was an experiment with psychiatrists um, on a, a teletype, and they weren't always sure if they were talking to a person or not. Um, I don't think it's that good, but um, it's kind of a parlor trick. It's not really that useful, um, but it's worth seeing at least once. If you haven't played with an Eliza, look online, you'll find one, and at least try it. Um, you've also used other kinds of parsers that are a little smarter, um, like uh, you know your Google Now or your Alexa or your Cortana. Um, that listen for certain key phrases, then after they've done the parsing step, then actually apply some NLU technology, try to figure out some of the things you're doing. Um, but generally is not a huge future just for the parser level. We talked about the simple response, fixed things. Um, they're fairly rigid. Um, here are some of the, here's a patient. Actually, let me go back for a second and set that up. So I do a lot of time, I make uh, virtual patients is one of the things I do in medicine. So I want to show some of those interactions. I'm going to show three brief interactions and comment about what's in the interactions. Some of my other colleagues do like other types of therapies that derive questions and try to help with health applications and things. But let's uh, look at the virtual patient. This is a, a, a system called standard patient that's an authoring community and it, people can make their own patients with it. So, Give you an example of what some of the interactions look like, although this is kind of an older version of it that doesn't look as good as the current one. So in that example, there are certain constraints. It's all questions about medicine. All the patients can answer the same variety of questions. The system's not picky exactly how you ask it. You can ask different ways and you can misspell, you can type or you can talk. Um, but it's generally you're talking, it's answering. Although sometimes the patients will ask you something back. Um, but that interplay is fairly limited. But we are able to successfully use that to evaluate medical interviewing skills and improve them providing specific speed feedback. 
uh, through repetitive practice, and it works, and it works really well. We've studied it. Um, and that's, this would be an example of using a natural language understanding sy AI system, and this is what we call an NLRA, or a natural language random access interaction. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what makes those successful or unsuccessful in a minute. Now, I'd like to show another way to interact with a virtual human. And I'll give a similar example of like a, a parent of a patient that has some concerns. So you notice this interaction was a little bit different. Um, here, choices were presented. Each time, it was your turn to talk. Um, everybody wants to, I want the thing where I can talk to the character and make it do the thing. The problem with that is the person has to know what to say. And most of the time, people are like, Bleh. you know, they don't always know what to say and can't get started unless they're a specialist. Like the, the medical doctors are trained to do medical interviews. So we know all the kinds of things they'll say and so if they say what they're trained to do, it's not a problem. If you're doing an informal greeting, getting to know a person, that's pretty predictable. But if you put this out in front of some people and say, oh yeah, we have this great NPC and he can be your buddy and all that, what do you say? Often people don't. And what we find that for these educational or interaction experiences, we want to be able to do things. We want certainty in knowing what they chose to do. So by giving choices, I've taken all the risk of understanding what the intention was. And that gives me a fulcrum of assessment. I know what they chose. And so I can make these conversations. And so what I want to move to is I want to move from this conversation here you just saw to show what these look like in the authoring tool, to give you an idea of some of the design patterns and some of the things you can do in these to make them work. So this is an example of just visually um, of the tool we use. And it shows the vaccine patient there. So you end up with a couple questions and it's starting to judge you from that and then the conversation branches out. So there's choices there, but you end up with kind of a red, yellow, or red outcome. You know, does she get the vaccine for the baby? Does she say, I'll think about it, maybe come back? Or does she say adamantly no? So for the purpose of this, this is to talk, to tra train uh, physicians to say, well, how can you reach an understanding with a parent about what is a, why it's important to vaccinate, for example? Now, this is a linear conversation. Uh, this would be the kid in Lord British's castle, right? And he'll say, and here's this, he says, gee, are you an adventurer? Gee, isn't that a cool sword you have? Um, can I touch your cool sword? You know, that sort of, sort of thing. And it could either go recursively or every time you talk, you just get a different phrase. It's just linear, it doesn't really do much. Those can be useful, but they're fairly simple. Now, if we want to, complicate it up a little bit, we can make the conversation branch and give choices, like you saw there. So here, someone says, I'm sure Emperor Mengst has been hard on your planet too. And the choice here, which is the red one, says, we want to overthrow him. Do you know Constable Jim Rayner? And then you end up getting arrested, okay? Fairly simple. Now this is as simple as a conversation this branching can be. What would happen in the real world is you add more and more of these branches to make the conversation more interesting. The problem with that is, if you're giving three choices or four choices or two choices, that's the exponent of complexity. All of a sudden, you've got hundreds of nodes in your conversations, potentially. So you have to find a way to bring them back into a single point or just a couple um, lines of conversation. Uh, otherwise, you end up with these super complex things with hundreds of possibilities. Um, so that's the danger with these. Um, but that's the basic principle of branching. Now, one thing you can do with branching is you can add other assessments. So let's say you're in a game or something, there's some other variable you mentioned, like how you did before, what loyalty you've demonstrated before. So here you've got the same conversation, but we've added logic nodes to assess, okay, I said the right thing, but am I trusted? 
Or I said the kind of middle thing, but am I going to be kind of forgiven and let it go on? Or am I going to get thrown in jail based on the other actions? That, and that could be other things you've done in the conversation. Or it could be things outside the conversation with agents because it might be depending on some decision point you've made earlier in the game you're building. Um, so this would be what I call branching judgment. There's, it's not just the branch you chose in the conversation, but it's some other factor and some other variable in the game you're building that determines w what direction that judgment call goes by the machine. Um, here's another example where we take a linear conversation. You know, we talk about Emperor Minx, then you talk about Zergs, then you talk about the ghosts, then you talk about Antigua Prime. And all along, you're getting credit for saying, are you loyal or trustworthy or whatever, but you're getting the same order of questioning in this conversation. But in the end, the logic nodes evaluate you what outcome you get. So that's simpler for you to author rather than having this turn into 60 different nodes. You just have the same, but it, it just evaluates your answers differently. So that's another interaction pattern with a choice-based conversation. Um, I'd like to show you another very simple choice-based conversation that was almost done as like an afterthought to help out the law school at USC where they have a course on interviewing children for, 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 for a court. And they want to teach open, they want to evaluate if people are using open or closed ended questioning techniques. So we made something uh, called virtual child witness. Um, and the results of how it worked actually really surprised us. So I'll show you a little example of that. You talk about a birthday party. So you, you get always presented with four choices. Tell me everything you did on your birthday. My friends came over, we had a party, and we played games. And topics unlock. Tell me about your Jim, friends coming over. Maddie, and my cousins came to my party to play games. So the general idea is uh, that if you ask more open-ended questions, he'll give longer answers and you'll unlock more topics to talk about and have a longer conversation to get more disclosure. And this was meant to be a test in a course, a seminar on interviewing children. It turns out that people were kind of obsessive and repeated the experience and improved their performance even though it's kind of ran, pseudo random what shows up every time. And people learned, even though we didn't teach them what we were uh, trying to go, just by showing a little scoreboard of like, how much you've unlocked, they realize what the rules they're being evaluated and they went and replayed it and learned. So here's an example of what that would look like. So you've got a conversation we saw before, but you unlocked something like you want to learn about Manx's underpants or something. You can unlock those conversation pathways. And so the unlocking mechanism takes a simpler conversation and makes it more complex in ways. Um, and that would be another design pattern in a choice-based dialogue system. And you kind of saw it. The choices pop up as extra buttons. Um, now, when we look at the natural language random access, uh, and this is a whole separate talk, they're, de they're dependent on artificial intelligence NLU systems. And there's different systems out there, um, some of them open source. It requires training language. And it requires a, the more training language, the better they work. And I would say that, uh, and they can be forgiving, but you have to understand they're not deterministic. It's not picking choice A or B, they're probabilistic. You'll probably get that answer if they ask it generally about something like this. And they're not perfect. Um, it is not possible to have a full scope human conversation. That does not exist. Um, but you can have success in a, perfect, a certain area by depending on constraints. The more you constrain a conversation and the possibilities, the more successfully the systems work. So you constrain the domain. Uh, for example, general medical questions, um, talking about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. You can make a great thing, talk about a museum for a virtual human museum tour guide. You can anticipate the things that people are going to talk about. Uh, a battle buddy in a video game, right? You could think, I want you to get that guy over there. I want you to support me, you know. It's probably a limited number of things you're typically going to want to talk to the character about. Um, constraining initiative. Generally, these things are designed that the virtual human's trying to pull information out of you or you're trying to pull information out of the virtual human. It's not give and take like human conversations where it changes. That's really hard to do. So generally you design around one direction or the other. And then scope. You can go broad or you can go deep. You can't do both. 
So like the virtual patient interview is fairly broad, but it's fairly thin. You can say, well, tell me more about that itching in your eye, and can you tell, you know, you can't go that deep. Um, and that's okay. Um, and it's also possible to mix the choice-based interactions, like you get a good answer uh, by asking a, a question in, an, in one of these, and then it can come back with you with a choice-based question. Well, what do you mean by that? It gives you the choices. Mixing them actually is pretty effective. Um, so what I'd like to show you, uh, so here's like standard patient. We studied it, and this is with the older version. We're to have a newer version now. We got about 92% performance with a, with a trained case. So 8% of the time, it's not gonna give an appropriate answer. And prior to that, the best performance was like in the 70s. Uh, pretty much under 85%, people are gonna get frustrated. Uh, and if you use voice recognition, it decreases the, that performance. This was typed input. Um, and it depends how many how technical the words you're using or how accurate it is. Um, we had a good training effect with this. We found that constraining time, time or choice actually improves their performance. And actually, we provide live feedback now, and we're actually finding that if we do only give them a certain number of questions they can ask or a certain amount of time, they like it. And it basically becomes an information collection game in a very simple way. Um, and then also people say weird things to computers. And I want to share you some examples of that. So here's examples of valid questions for the virtual patient, right? And these are pretty, do your ears hurt? Because, it hurt, you know, do, can you describe the pain? These are fairly generic questions. But here's some things that didn't match. So, for example, do you wear earplugs when you swim? We didn't anticipate that question, and it didn't understand it. Or someone said, do you feel faint? That was a valid question, but it actually matched that to fainting, which is syncope. So we had to train that specific item for the future so it would respond appropriately. Or people would just say kind of improper questions we could never understand. And you have to understand when you build agents like this, there always will be hap things you will not anticipate, like Falk mailbox. Um, is anyone around you sick where they spelled it wrong or what kind of beer or any problems, Hermig? I can't anticipate every misspelling someone's gonna do. Um, but then some people try cheating. Well, what if I just wanna know if they're depressed? They would type in words like depression, worried, grades, education. And uh, actually, we, we can spot for that now and have the patient like, can you like, talk to me in complete sentence? You, do, do you talk to your mother that way? And you can make the patient say that sort of thing. And then you've still got that same person. Even though they've gone to medical school now, they do weird things. And here's some things, real things from the transcript. Um, a lot of people said, I think you're getting fat to the female <coughs> character. And she really isn't fat. Or I'm a pretty amazing doctor. Or dang, that's cold. I think uh, someone got put down by her. Um, finally, I'd like to close with another way you can do dialogue. So we take our dialogue system, and we not only look at what you say, but how you say it, and what sort of facial expressions you use, and the attention you pay to the patient to see if the patient judges you and likes you. So I'm gonna have a young lady set up with a young, I'm gonna show you two videos, they're fairly quick. I'm gonna show you a young lady who wants oral contraceptive pills, and she's asking for them for her skin. She trusted him, told him the truth. All right, let's try it with someone else. Poor attentiveness, poor eye contact, shocked expression, judgment, showing sign of judgment. Confrontational, the way he says things. She doesn't trust him. So, what I would basically say is I wanted to share a little bit of this research we're doing 
and we're using for educational purposes because what I see in the future is I think NPCs could be a lot more powerful, a bigger part of the narrative, and much more interactive than they are now. Um, and I'm, I'm not here to point out the roadmap to do that, but I think it's something that would be really cool. And these tools that I'm just, and techniques I'm sharing at a very surface level are some of the early building blocks to doing that. And that's what I want to share with you today. Thank you very much. And we've got our other talk coming up, but any quick question? Yes, sir. So um, what frameworks do you use for NLP? Was it product that you showed, like um, answer parser or something? We use actually our own stuff, but we have a whole virtual human life cycle Institute for Creative Technologies at USC. We do everything from the animation to the nonverbals. Some of it's open source, like Smart Body, which does fidgets and all kinds of other things. We use a, a, an AI system called Flores, which is a goal-seeking AI we developed in-house which is very good and we haven't even utilized all the capabilities. So I can basically, I can take, put, take text and it does all the animations to so talk about you and me. It will probably point at you and me like this, basically analyzing the words. Uh, and then I can set tuning, like is this like a morose person or is this like a really uh, active person and you know, whatever or avoidant. You can set those general parameters and then you just let the computer do its thing. Good question. Any other questions? All right, well, I want to thank you very much, and uh, good luck at the next session. Thank you. <laughs>